Let's turn together in Romans 3. We'll be looking at verses 19 and 20 together this morning. Romans 3, verses 19 and 20. Romans 3, verses 19 and 20, where God's word reads as follows. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So far, the reading from God's word this morning may he add its blessing to our hearts. Sometimes we get sideways with the people who live around us. And we can tell that we have done wrong to somebody by using a variety of ways. Sociologists would say that you look at some kind of uh, agreed-upon set of boundaries, uh, an agreed-upon set of social conventions, and you look at that, and maybe not consciously, but unconsciously, you ask yourself, have I violated that person's rights and privileges based on these agreed-upon boundaries and social conventions. And from a human perspective, there's some truth to that. Uh, sociologists make some worthwhile observations, although they miss the mark in the ultimate sense in terms of how you can tell you have done wrong against the person. That same thing is true when it comes to God. You can never look at a social convention to ask yourself if I've wronged God. Certainly, as we looked at the summary of the law of God this morning, we saw love for God, love for fellow man, is the foundation of why God gives his commandments. We discern rightness and wrongness in relationship by a consideration of how God has told us to live. And so we know that a social convention can't be the foundation of our reasons for apology because... Ultimately, social conventions will vary from one culture to another. And this text is here to remind us that if we truly want to see whether we have wronged man, less significantly even, but more significantly, if we have wronged the God of heaven, we must not look to anything that is around us other than what God has made known to us uh, in his word. There is only one place where everybody can look and be certain to have a faithful understanding of whether they have wronged an individual or whether they have wronged the God of heaven. That's the function of the law of God. That is the function of the commandments that he gives to us. And this text that we are considering today is the last in the bad news cycle of the book of Romans, if you can call it that, this this labor that the Apostle Paul has had to show everybody, everybody who might ever read this book, that they are in need of the gospel. And as he is concluding his argument, he makes sure that we understand that the law is the standard by which we judge the health of our relationship with God. Now that's a bleak picture for man. That is not meant to encourage us. We are not, not meant to feel good about ourselves in relationship to the law. And this text makes that very clear because what we see in terms of doctrine in this text is that the purpose of the law is to show those who are under it that they are sinners. Show those who are under it that they are in a deficit in terms of their relationship with God. And we want to learn that lesson from this text by looking at it in two parts. First, we want to see the lesson that the law teaches us, which is in two parts in verse 19. And then we want to look at the conclusion that is to be drawn from that in verse 20. So we want to learn that the purpose of the law is to show those who are under it that they are sinners. And first we want to see the lessons from the law in verse 19, and second, the conclusions that are to be drawn from it. So we're going to begin by looking at the lessons that the law teaches us. Again, the, the culmination of Romans 1 through 3 is that everybody needs the gospel. That's the lesson it's trying to teach you. He begins by introducing the gospel as the power of God for salvation to everybody who believes. And then he spends the next two and a half chapters or so impressing on everybody that they need this gospel. 
you should never think yourself exempt from this power of God unto salvation. And even if we might become weary of considering again the sinfulness of man in relation to the law of God, we should always recognize that this is a most urgent message. This is a message that all of us must hear and reflect on and not apply to the people who are around us who, who we might think have messed up and, and maybe even we think that based on the law of God they have wronged us. That's not the objective of Romans 1 through 3. The objective of, of Romans 1 through 3 is that you might know that you are in need of this gospel, that I might know that I am in need of this gospel, this power of God for salvation, that I might trust in him for it, that I might rely on him, on him for it. And to make that point, Paul is especially in this section dealing with the person who thinks him or herself to be a meticulous keeper of the law. As Paul is writing this section, he is dealing with those who are under the law, who are looking at the law as the foundation, the reason, reason of why they would be in a right relationship with God. Now, it wouldn't be hard for us to, to, to muse on whether or not Paul sees himself, at least in his former way of life, in the reprimand that he gives to us in this text. When you think about the Apostle Paul before the Damascus Road experience, when he is gloriously converted in, a, in an extraordinary way by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul was a meticulous law keeper. He describes himself that way. That's how we know it. In Philippians 3, in verse 4 through 6, the Apostle Paul speaks of what his life was like prior to his conversion. Listen to how he describes himself. If anyone else, says Paul, thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. That's how the Apostle Paul describes himself prior to his life with Christ, externally anyways, pursuing the law to such an extent that he would be able to describe himself as blameless under the law. Now, there is great danger for a person who thinks that way about himself. There is great danger of a person who is meticulous in his law keeping for the purpose of presenting himself to God as acceptable. Because a person who thinks in this way looks at his debt before God and says, my debt is not so great. How could my debt be great? Look at all the things that I have done for God. Look at all the things that I have done in the service of his people. Look at all the things that I have done in caring for those who are weak in the world. Look at all the things that I have done in caring for those who have treated me unkindly. And a person could come to the conclusion that he simply needs Christ for a little bit of a, a leg up. He's got 95% of it under control. If God could just help him with the last 5%, then everything is going to be okay. Jesus describes the self-righteous in that way. In his parable that he tells of the, the Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke 18, there you have the, the description is the, the Pharisee, the, the, the meticulous law keeper. He comes into the temple and he's He's praying to God, but he's praising himself as he's praying to God. He's, he, he is pointing at other people saying, well, thank goodness I'm not anything like those people because they got problems, but I, on the other hand, am accomplished. And so in his prayer, he's presenting his resume. He's not only critical of the people who he sees around himself, but he also lifts up his own good works. He, he, he talks about how he fasts meticulously, regularly, how he... He ties on all the parts of his income at a, in, at a level of detail that, that you and I can't even imagine in this time. And that is the foundation for the Pharisees' self-righteousness. And the point of the text that we're considering together this morning is aimed at those kind of spiritual, religious, high achievers. It's, it's pushing the nose of the spiritual high achiever into God's word and showing them that they are the ones 
who need this gospel, that they are the ones who stand in need of Christ who has come. And this is really the culmination of all that Paul has been saying, because he's been talking to us about these things for some time, pressing really home on the heart of the high achiever, the, the religious, the, the person who exercises from, a, from his flesh religious discipline. He's been showing that person his need of the gospel. Back in chapter 2 and verse 17, he began talking about the hypocrisy of the person who lives according to the law, thinking that he will present himself, showing to that person that you teach one thing and you do another. He's talked to us about how our external doing must be matched with an internal reality, how the person who is uncircumcised but does the law is in a better place than the person who is circumcised but doesn't do the law. There is a spiritual reality that motivates somebody to keep the commandments of God. And Paul has shown to the religious high achiever that he's not meeting that standard. He has shown to us that the Jews, through their covenant relationship with God, through their covenant inclusion, have an advantage. An advantage that is external to be sure, but an advantage nonetheless. And yet, he has pressed home to us the last time we were in Romans together, that the Jew is no better off because of these external advantages. The external advantages remain external unless it is joined to the heart of faith. And that is what Paul has labored in the book of Romans so far to press home on us. And now, as the capstone of all of that argumentation, is this notion that the law actually singles out not the person who lives lawlessly in society, that's not primarily who the law is addressing. The law is primarily addressing, it says in verse 19, those who are under the law. So the commandments of God are primarily an agent of conviction for those who are familiar with it. That means that the law isn't to be used to say, here is what the law says, and now I can find somebody out there, a godless pagan who is living in rebellion against God's commandments, Certainly, there, it says in the book of Romans that there, that there is sin without the law and that those who are without the law will face the condemnation of God. But this is not addressing those people. This is addressing this room. The book of Romans is, is addressing everybody who's gathered here today, who, who is familiar with the commandments of God and thinking that in keeping it, they can present themselves as favorable in God's sight. Now that, of course, Paul is, a, is applying it primarily to the Jews. That's who he's talking about. That's who he references in Romans 3. That's an Old Testament way of identifying the covenant people of God. But, but we also can apply that same truth to the church. The, 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 the message uh, for the church is also that we should see the law as a convicting agent in our lives. Because the danger... For people who live in, with a, a self-aware relationship with God, people who live self-aware of their covenant status with God, the danger for those kinds of people is exactly what's being described in this book. This spiritual pride that we can take on ourselves. When we read God's word, we've been raised in the church and we were familiar with with the, the commandments of God, and instead of using the commandments of God as they are meant to be used, that we would be convicted by them, what do we say? Well, surely these commandments are necessarily for me. Yeah, they're for me a little bit, but they're mostly for those people out there. And what Romans is saying here is that these commandments are exactly for you. They are especially for you. They are for you more so than they are for the people who live outside the walls of the church. The law speaks to the people who are under the law. Verse 19 says there's two reasons why the law does that. There's two reasons why the law is aimed at those who are under the law. First of all, that every mouth would be stopped. It says that in verse 19. And the second reason given in verse 19 is that the whole world would be accountable and guilty before God. So, so think first with me about this notion that the law of God given to those under the law will stop every mouth. The danger of the Christian 
is that he elevates himself. Uh, to be under the law can be to improve yourself by law keeping so that you would increase in your faithfulness in the ways of the Lord. And that is not a bad thing. We should seek to be faithful to the commandments of God as his children. However, what happens when we replace service of God with service of self? We elevate ourselves. We, we are likely to think more of ourselves than we should. We are likely to think of ourselves as closer to God than the people who are around us, who are not doing the things that we are doing. And so therefore, we think that we have a bit more of a voice before the God of heaven. If you have grown up in a family, you're familiar with this idea. Uh, in families, usually the, the way it works, and I've seen this as a repeated pattern in my own family, the oldest child in the home typically thinks it's, uh, it's you, Dad, and, and Mom, and me, and then there's the rest of the kids that we have to manage. That's usually how the oldest one thinks in a family. And the, the, the interesting thing is, when that oldest child moves on, and they leave your home, there's a, well, in our case, there's a whole army of, uh, of people competing for that elevated position, right? It, it could be something strange. It could be uh, the place where the oldest sat at the supper table. They, they want to have that place. Or the color of cup that the, that the oldest drank out of at home, and they want to have that cup. And in some sense, that's a status symbol. Uh, I hope you have this in your family. I hope I'm not the only one who has this in my, my home. And, and so what happens as a result of this, this shift from the oldest one leaving to the, the next one's coming up through, in some sense is natural and normal, and in another sense it's a, it's a claiming of, of status. It's a, qua a claiming of a higher position which often comes with this transition time where there is a struggle with the authority of mom and dad and, and, the, and the, 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 the submission to the rules of mom and dad. The same thing can happen in the life of the Christian and his, his life with God. He, he thinks himself elevated because he has been successful in this one area of law-keeping that he's focusing on. He thinks that he is closer to God because of what he has done, and therefore the Christian becomes a little bit too free with his lips as he speaks to God. This is the lesson that we learned from our brother Job. You remember Job, he's a righteous man. He, he is faithful, he's diligent to keep the commandments of God, and that's what gets Job into trouble. Because when God gives to him circumstances that Job doesn't approve of, initially he acknowledges God as having every right to do that, but as that book progresses you see Job beginning to grumble. You see Job beginning to want to argue with God. In Job 13 and verse 3, Job says, I would speak to the Almighty. I desire to argue my case with God. Or a little bit later in that same chapter, verse 18, Behold, Job says, I have prepared my case. I know that I shall be in the right. That's Job, the righteous man, arguing with God from a position of him recognizing his own righteousness, that he thinks that he can now argue with the God of heaven. And when we feel that way, we have gone so far sideways in our self-assessment. We have gone so far sideways in how we present ourselves to God because the purpose of the law, it says in verse 19, is not so that we would be more liberal with our lips before God. What does it say in the text? That every mouth may be stopped. So the law is given so that we would not speak to God, so that we would not take issue with Him, so that we would be silenced before Him, recognizing Him as holy and just and powerful and so on, and, and, and we not being that. The, the realization of guilt does that to you. And that's why the law isn't just for those out there. The law isn't just to convict people who are living, uh, living out of accord with God's law out there. It's for the people who are in here. The people who are in this room today. For God's people to know through the law that they must have Christ. Is that how the law is working for you today?
Is that how the law is being applied in your life today? As a mirror to silence you? As a, a mirror to show you your guilt? When you look at the law and your relationship to the law, does it make you boast about what you've done? Or are you silent before God because you see your sin? The right use is the second one. That you would be silent before God because the law is there to show you your need of Christ. And that has a, a second part to it, of course. When our mouths are stopped, it's because the whole world now realizes that they are accountable, that they are accountable before God. Every hypocriti hypocritical heart in the church is silenced before God. Through the law, everybody in the church recognizes that they are accountable before God. That's the second part that's in verse 19, that the whole world may be held accountable to God. Now, the Greek word for accountable can be translated that way. I think there is a, a better translation that ties in more with what the Apostle Paul has been saying so far in Romans 3. And you can also translate that word as somebody recognizing that they are liable to be tried or even somebody recognizing that they are guilty before God so that it would, it would read something like this, that the whole world would know that they are liable to God or that the whole world would know that they are guilty before God. And that seems to me to be more in line with the context of what Paul is saying here. There is this awareness that is often lacking in the Christian church, this awareness that is lacking with regard to our own personal guilt. And that's what happens when a church constantly is looking to the outside. And I would submit to you as people who I love that that can be the tendency of this congregation. That can be our tendency here. A, a church like Cliffwood, this text serves to give to us a great warning. Why? Because we speak of sin. And we look to the Scripture. And we look to the Scripture to set the standard on the value of life, on human sexuality. And we look to God's Word to guide and direct us in our entertainment in our ministry activity, in our conversation even. And the tendency that can have is that instead of looking carefully at self, we begin to look at those who are around us. But the law is given for us. The law is given for those who are under the law, those who are part of the covenant family. Why? So that our mouths would be silenced and that we would acknowledge that we are liable for God's condemnation. That we are guilty before God. And so in looking to God's law, when we think about His standards of holiness, those are good exercises. We should be students of the law of God. We should be careful in keeping the law of God. There will be more about that as we work our way through the book of Romans. We are to see man as made in God's image. We are to draw what holiness looks like from the commandments of God, from His Word. We are to think that way, but we should never think of that as something that makes us closer to God, something that holds us close to Him, something that justifies us. The law is there to show you and me that we are liable to be tried by the Creator of the world. It's not for the bad people out there. It's for the role models of the church. Think of the person in the Christian community that you look up to the most. I guarantee you that role model in the church, that person who is sanctified and who you aspire to be like in your Christian walk, that person is sinful in thought, word, and deed every single day. Why do we stress that? So that all would look away from self. So that all would recognize the need for salvation, this gospel, this power of God given to all who believe. That is the message that the book of Romans is establishing, not just for some people, not just for some people that we can think of in our contact database, 
who really are struggling, who we think could use some help, no, that message is for you. That message is for me. That we would never wander away from a recognition of our dependence on the grace of God when it comes to salvation. That's a lesson from the law. And there's a conclusion to be drawn from it, which the Apostle Paul records in verse 20. This explanation of the purpose of law. So in verse 19, we see that the law is speaking to those under the law to silence them so that they would know that they're guilty before God, accountable to Him. And then verse 20 shows kind of the background that that informs that lesson. It is a lesson that Christians have struggled to hold on to from the beginning of the church. One of the books of the New Testament is written to a church that has lost sight of the gospel, that began with the power of the Holy Spirit and now is returning to the flesh. That's the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians replaces the true gospel that called them out of the world and now has added human obedience to the gospel. It is a church not unlike ours, which begins with salvation in Christ only. But this church has gone astray. It, in, it has introduced law-keeping as at least partially the basis of being justified. Now, we want to make sure that we understand what it means to be justified. Justification is a central doctrine in the Bible. It is key for us to understand what Paul is saying here about the law in response to this notion of justification, because it says in verse 20 that no human being, no human soul will be justified in God's sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So our law keeping can never be participating in our justification. Well, our, our catechism can help us understand justification. It looks at scripture, draws from scripture to give a, a, a definition of what justification might be. And in Shorter Catechism 33, it asks the question, what is justification? And here's the answer. Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. So justification has several parts. First of all, it is God's gracious gift. Second of all, it is an instant where he gives pardon for sin. Third of all, it, make, it makes him accept us as righteous in his sight because the righteousness of Christ has been transferred to your account and it is received only by faith, not by law keeping. That is what justification does. And as Paul presses the need for the gospel, he is pressing the understanding that we cannot look to self. This last part of what it means to be justified, that it is received by faith in Christ alone. That is what Paul is making you, he's making you squirm under it. He's making me squirm under it. That, that there's, nef, there's nothing in me that is good enough. That I must look away from self, that I must look to Christ only. No human being, it says, literally, none of all flesh is justified by works of the law. In other words, no one receives pardon for sin. No one is counted as righteous by God because of what they have done in keeping the commandments. In our country, our president has the power to pardon. When the president pardons, he removes the guilt of an offense. He, he removes the sentence that is associated with that, uh, that offense as well. He sets aside punishment for crimes as if the crime didn't happen. The, the, the guilt and punishment for our sin is never pardoned because of works of the law. There is a sense in which our sin is pardoned, but it is not by your works of the law. And Paul is reminding the church in general, specifically in the book of Galatians, a church that has fallen into this way of thinking, that they should not look there. In Galatians 3, in verse 3, the second part of that verse, Paul asks them this question. It's, a, it's a, a question that has an obvious answer. Having begun by the Spirit, he asks, are you now being perfected in the flesh? 
That's the same question that Romans is asking us today. Are you under the law? Are, are you in covenant with God? Well, you need the gospel. You need to be reminded of your need of the gospel, this power of God for salvation for, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So, so this power of God for salvation is not something that's just external, not just something for the people out there. It is for the people out there, but you must have it. You must know it too. You cannot come to God and present your obedience to him as if it would be impressive to the Lord. So, set us that, so that he would set aside your guilt for your sin. This text, is verse 20, makes sure that we know none of all flesh is declared righteous in God's sight because of law keeping. And knowing that at the start of your walk with God in Christ, and having been established with that when you place your faith and trust in Christ, you would be foolish, you would be foolish to present yourself therefore perfect in law keeping. It's not even what the law shows to you. If you look at the law and think perfection, if you look at the law and you think personal accomplishment, you are misusing the law. The law does not show you your accomplishment. The law is not there to affirm you. When the Christian looks at the law, what should he see? It says it in this text. The last part of it. Through the law comes knowledge of sin. The law is God's tool to make a person recognize that he is in need of being justified. That he needs to be pardoned. That he needs to be made righteous. The law says, here is God's standard of holiness. Now live according to it. And it begins with the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Now what does humanity do with that command? What has the, what has the, the people of God done with that command? Well, you can look outside of the people of God and you can look at the gods of antiquity, right? Uh, Thor and Zeus and Venus and gods like that. You could look in Scripture and see false gods outside of the people of God. You can look at the Baal and the Ashtoreths and the, the Molex of Scripture. And you can certainly see it in the gods of today's competing religions and, and people who are calling on Allah or Buddha or Brahma or, or Vishnu or those kinds of things. But then there is the idol that is also in the church. This, this idol of self. This idol that makes a man question God. This idol that makes a man lay blame at God's feet. This idol that makes man grumble against the providences of God. We can look at the world and we can see why the world is in disarray. Because it doesn't learn what the law teaches about sin. It, it, it dismisses the law and it tries to amend the law. But why is it that the church is so ineffective? Why is it that the church is so weak? It's for two reasons. Because people want to walk next to the world without ever showing them the mirror of God's law. There, there is never a declaration of God's holiness, man's sin in his sight from the church, or man wants to use the law only to point at their neighbor. The church only wants to use the law to condemn the people around them without letting the law speak to themselves first, without learning from the law themselves, pointing at other people with the law. And people recognize that as hypocrisy immediately. That's why the church is weak. That's why the church is, is ineffective. So what should we do then? Having all this culmination of Paul's finger pointing, Paul's been pointing his finger in our chest for a long time. What do you do as you come to the end of it? Well, you don't, you don't bristle yourself against what Paul is saying. You don't refuse to hear what Paul is saying. It's the very word of God. So you let the law teach you your sin, that you would see Christ and your need for him and your dependence on him and that it lasts throughout all your life. The law does not exist so that you can 
hold up its canvas next to somebody else or even next to the world as a whole and say, look at how awful the world is. Fortunately, we're not in the world. We're in the church. The law is here so that we would see it. If we look at the law and only look away from ourselves and only look to other people, we're behaving like Jonah. That, that's what Jonah did when he went to Nineveh and he proclaimed judgment against this city. What did Jonah do? He went and sat down on a mountain. He could see the condemnation because they were the bad people. He didn't even want to go because he knew God would be merciful to people like that. He didn't want any part of it. He simply wanted the law to condemn the people of Nineveh. But the law exists so that you would first know your own sin. So that you would see and recognize the way that you have set up something else as more important than God. You have other gods before you. And the law is there to help you see it. To help you recognize it. When your desires trump, take precedence over God's prohibitions. The things that God says you shouldn't do. When you do them, guess what? There's another God in your life. Or the law of God helps you to see and recognize ways in which you corrupt the worship of the true God. When you feel like it would be just so much better if we worship God in this other way, which he has not commanded. When my feelings become the arbiter of what should or shouldn't be done in serving God. The law helps you to see and recognize the different ways in which your thoughts, words, and deeds bring down the holiness of God and cause you to think slightly of Him or cause other people to think slightly of God. The law of God helps us to see and recognize different ways in which we minimize the worship of God, either by forsaking the opportunities that we have to gather with the saints and worship or by being present with the saints in worship and having a detailed, uh, a detailed catalog of, of how many stones are on this back wall because you're present in body, but you're absent in spirit and you're thinking about something completely different. The law helps you to see and recognize the different ways in which you usurp the lawful authorities that God has placed in your life so that you might be your own master. The law helps you to see and recognize the different ways in which your heart is turned against your brother who is made in the image and likeness of God for his destruction, where you don't seek his good, where you don't seek uh, his benefits, but you seek his harm. The law of God helps you to see and recognize the different ways that you allow your thoughts, your looks, to dishonor your neighbor with filthy intention and the way in which your decisions and presentation tempts towards them sinful thoughts. The, the law of God helps you to see and recognize your discontentment towards God in the, in the things that he has given to you. We live in one of the most wealthiest times and in the most wealthiest places of human history. And how, much of, how many of us at times wonder why the neighbor has that nice car and we don't? Why the neighbor has this bigger house, this nicer house. Why, why this person got the promotion and not me. We desire the things that God has not given to us, and the law shows us that. The law helps us to see and recognize the ways in which we fail to promote the truth, either through slander or gossip or, or lying, those kinds of things. The law helps us to see and recognize the corruption within our own hearts, even as we grumble against God, when we should be filled with joy and thanksgiving over all that we've received, we fail in that way, and the law holds itself up as a mirror and convicts us in that. And if you are here right now and you're, you're saying to yourself, why are we talking about sin? Why, why are we needing to talk about this? Why do I need to look at myself so much? My friend, you have missed the purpose of the law if you're asking that question. The law is there to show you your standing before the holy God who created you. And if you do not see that standing as being deficient, 
as you do not see your own failures before God, you will not seek reconciliation from Him. The church is being instructed. It's being shown who she is. That she might humbly share with the world what the world must do. We will never find peace in our own doing. We will never find peace in our own activity. Because the law will always be there condemning you. And yet in Christ, the full requirements of the law are surely met. Christ's righteousness is indeed perfect. And that is the great pivot of the gospel. That's the pivot where the gospel begins with bad news and then gives good news. Now, we've just had, it feels like, dump trucks full of bad news dumped on us for a long period of time. But we're about to pivot to this good news, this hope that we have in Christ only. This text tells us that it is those who are under the law who are addressed by the law. And whereas they might be tempted to speak of their good performance, the law stops their mouths. The law shows them that they are liable to judgment from God. That is because the law, when rightly used, first shows man that he cannot be declared righteous by God through what he has done. Because the law is there to show your sin. The law is not for those out there. The law is for those who are in here, in this room, this morning. And it is God's gift to you. It's how he lays the foundation of his gospel. The question that this text is asking is, do you know your sin today? Do you know what your sin does in you? And when you answer that question according to God's word, then only will you recognize that you need this Christ, this power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It's only then that you will see clearly how it is you will be reconciled to the God whom you have offended. Let's pray together.